Okay, uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here and to talk about particles. And uh, it's a great honor to be introduced by Professor Riggers, who have, I have admired uh, his work all along. So I'd like to tell you a few things about particle methods. I think they are wonderful. I think you also believe they are wonderful. And I'd like to give you some ideas, at least in our group, what we believe we can do and what we cannot um, do about them. So the talk, I'll try to tell you to distinguish two particles. As Professor Onyate said earlier, I'll talk about particles that are used as approximations. And I'd like to say um, that being in Switzerland, you usually have to compromise. So the compromise that you will present here is about particles and grids. Um, and I would say that we need to have grids in case these particles fail. But nevertheless, we can be inspired by grids and come up with um, uh, particles that they have not only Lagrangian adaptivity, but they can have multi-resolution adaptivity by wavelets. And then I hope to be able to say a few things about particles that are used not as approximations, but as models. I'd like to say something about their high-performance computing implementation and perhaps a few things about uh, uncertainty. So why are particles amazing? In my opinion, they're amazing because there is no other method that is capable of spanning uh, um, simulations of 18 orders of magnitude. Going from molecular dynamics to smooth particle hydrodynamics that people do in astrophysics, I think you can do all these different things by using a particle-based uh, framework. So what is the particle-based framework? So particles, as you all know, are very simple, uh, or seemingly simple. They start by moving particles and the particle locations. And then you follow, in the case of the continuum equations, you follow a Lagrangian description of the uh, equation, of the Newton's equation, basically. Uh, this is the momentum equation. And then you have to worry about how do you discretize this divergence of the stress tensor. But then in the case of fluid mechanics, this is uh, Navier-Stokes equations, and this is the collision of two vortex tubes. And you see the particles carrying vorticity in this particular case and how they are adapting to resolve uh, the field. Now, what is unique about particles and what brings them all together is when you go down to the atomistic level, again, it's not that you change anything. In a sense, the only thing that you change is that here you get conservation laws that are giving you this divergence of a particular stress tensor. In the other case, you are coming up with a force field that actually a lot of modeling is going into it. In this particular case, we start with conservation laws. Here we can decide what it is. So for example, we can look into carbon nanotubes and water and study these things in atomistic detail. But what is unique, again, about particles is they basically rely on this set uh, of equations. So first, I'd like to say a few things about the top part, about the approximations and, and what are the issues with them. But let's be reminded a little bit of history and um, say that some of the first simulations actually they appeared, marker and cell, they actually combined grids and particles. This is the simulations of Harlow and Wells. And I want to remind you of another particular method that I come from. That's where I was educated, and this was vortex methods. Vortex methods is about taking the Navier-Stokes, solving them in velocity vorticity formulation, and there is a fantastic method because you need no grid. Uh, you can do very complex geometries, you have automatic adaptivity, and you have the minimum set of computational elements that you can have. You don't have any grid, these are all your computational elements. So back in the 60s and 80s, people like Chorin, um, uh, uh, Leonard, uh, Belotcherkovsky, they did wonderful works, but nevertheless, vortex methods died. And they died a miserable death because people from finite differences started to come up and say, hey guys, you cannot do 3D, you cannot do boundary as well, your cost is very expensive, you scale like order n squared, and there was no theory of convergence. You would double the number of particles, you will get a different uh, result. Now, at the same time that vortex methods, which is the velocity vorticity form of the Navier-Stokes died, Another method started to become very popular, and I'm sure many of you know it. It's smooth particle hydrodynamics, where what is unique here is you go back. Instead of doing velocity vorticity, you're doing velocity pressure, and you have it easy because you don't have a Poisson equation. So it's everything we were doing in vortex methods, but SPH, working in velocity pressure, does not assume a Poisson equation, so you don't have this cost of n squared that the vortex particles had. But I think all these other issues uh, remain. And in fact, um, you can do some simple tests to show that. So here is the simple test, which is uh, a circular patch of vorticity. And this is a solution of the Euler equations. And what's nice about that is that it's an exact solution of the Euler equations. And it's a very boring solution because it says that if you start with a circular patch, you should remain with a circular patch of vorticity. 
Now, if you run it with particles, this is what you get. And, and what I usually say, this is the reason why particle methods are popular in astrophysics. You always get some kind of galaxy. So um, now we fixed that, and we fixed that, and we did actually some benchmark uh, simulations. And this is the flow past an impulsively started cylinder. And what is special about that, and what finite differences and others cannot do, if you look at the vorticity around the cylinder, you have to know where the secondary vorticity appears, and there you have to refine. And if you don't refine, all these fine structures you're not going to get, and then your drag is going to be all over the place. What is also nice about that, there is also an analytical solution for early times, and I think you will find not many methods that are able to capture this analytical solution at early times, including uh, techniques like finite differences of high order. What happens, this is the analytical solution. It has a 1 over square root of nu t, and a lot of numerical methods, they fail to capture that, but remarkably, they can uh, recover. But this is an, another topic. So what was the main thing behind what we did? It was the problem of remeshing. And what is remeshing? So let's be reminded for a moment where do particles come from as approximations. We start with a quantity of interest. It can be also a differential operator. And we approximate it uh, with an integral of delta functions. And then we use particles. So the integral becomes a quadrature. So we can put it in the computer. And then you can have many of them. But then let's look at two of them. And then when we go back, maybe we don't like to have only discrete particles because we don't know what's happening in between. So we go ahead and we mollify the delta function. So when you mollify the delta function, basically you replace it with a smooth function, a Gaussian or anything like that. And then you give a core to the particles that is barely visible. But what's visible to you is the overlap that you need to have between two particles. Now, again, you want to compute. So you have a mollification of the delta function. This is one length scale for particle approximations. And then you have a quadrature to put things in the computer. So you immediately get a second length scale, which is the quadrature size, this h. And then a lot of people have done theory, and they tell you that because of this, you make an error that goes like that, which has to do with how well this function approximates this. And then you get one more nasty error, which is h over epsilon. And h over epsilon has to be less than 1 for the methods to converge. And that's what killed vortex methods. And that's what actually we fixed. Now, what happens at later times is when you have a dynamical system, the particles go apart. The h becomes larger than epsilon. And then this is where all the problems uh, start to begin. So this particle distortion, we were not the first who thought about that, uh, about fixing it. So a lot of people have tried to think about that. And I will not be putting any names here, because a lot of people have done it. So it would not be fair to put anybody else up there uh, alone. So one idea is you modify the smoothing kernel. Okay, You want to maintain h over epsilon to be less than 1, change the epsilon. You can reinitialize the particle strength. There you go and you solve some small systems of equations. This is the works of the reproducing kernel particle methods, very popular in mechanics. You can do things with Voronoi meshes. Uh, you can do uh, modify the advection velocity. And what is remarkable is that a lot of these techniques, they have a different behavior in, in mechanics, different behavior in fluid mechanics. Fluid mechanics has larger distortions. Mechanics has smaller distortions. So sometimes the problem for which you apply these methods may actually work, but maybe they're not a general way uh, to solve the problem. For fluid mechanics, for which there's very large distortions, we came up with the idea of reprojecting particles on a mesh. And what is bad about that, I know I'm in a particle conference and I talk about grids, but nevertheless, I'd like to show you that you can have both of the two things. And you can actually, as particles people, we can have all the nice things that we do as particles and use all the nice things that grid people do. And the problem with that is that maybe we have to abandon the dogma of mess-free particle methods. So how does it work? You start with particles. You don't like them anymore. You put a grid. It's a Cartesian regular grid. You interpolate. And you can interpolate with moment-conserving formulas that I'll show you in a second. You basically create a mapping like this. Uh, and then the next thing that happens is you get rid of the old particles. And now you have the new particles. And in fact, the picture that you see over there on the right, it's actually not a picture, but it's a movie, which we have solved, actually, the problem of the circular paths by doing uh, remeshing. Um, remeshing becomes very, very interesting. Uh, and there's some wonderful work by Georges Henri Coté, who actually showed from Grenoble, who actually has shown what's the relationship between remeshed particle methods 
and finite differences, but I will not get into that. Actually, you can see that finite differences become a subset of remiss particle methods. But what I would like to, pay, to, to point you out is that you actually, by using these Cartesian grids where you can do the remeshing, then you can use other techniques to do um, complex geometries by adding a forcing term and employing penalization or immersed uh, boundary methods. So how do the methods work? You advect particles, so you maintain the large CFL particle methods are good for. Then you have to do this horrible thing of putting particles back onto a mesh, but then you can use the mesh for computing every derivative you like. Those of you who do SPH, you can imagine that uh, you have to do in 2D about 25 operations to carry a derivative. People who do finite differences, they can do it with five, and, and the story becomes worse in, in three dimensions. Plus, you can do everything with Poisson solvers. You don't have to do fast multiples. And then the new thing is that the following time step, you forget the old particles, and then your mess nodes, the grid, becomes particles to be advected. Uh, so here are some examples of what we can do with that. This is the collision of two vortex tubes. It's uh, considered a challenging problem. People look for singularities of the Navier-Stokes. And what is nice about that, you see these two vortex tubes. They collide. They generate very strong vorticity. Then there is some kind of swirl that is imparted in there. And then when the two vortices, they collide, even though the vorticity is weaker, you get even more uh, stronger vorticity because of the swirl and the extra stretching term that you have there. I'm showing you this because we did a one-to-one -one comparison with pseudospectral methods, and pseudospectral methods in a periodic domain are supposed to be the kings, but particle methods, these remissed particle methods, you can see that one-to-one, -one, they hold their ground. And there's other things that pseudospectral methods they cannot do, like falling bodies that here we compare with finite element methods, or fish swimming where we compare with finite volume methods. So what is nice about this framework is that you can do things in that only one type of a method, like pseudospectral methods we do, or finite element methods we do, or finite volume methods we do, under one roof. And now come the problems. And the problems that I start to get is the problems when I try to do um, problems that they have discontinuities, or problems for which my divergent free field is, which actually the advection field is non-divergent free. And there, what happens is that the remeshing, when the remeshing tries to do uh, an interpolation around strong discontinuities, it fails. And there is actually, again, work by Cote that he has come up with new Wino-type remeshing. But this story of the failure between grids and particles and, and how they handle that, um, I want to show you a benchmark case that people have done in astrophysics. And, and what they did is they looked at this problem of a shock bubble interaction uh, with periodic boundary conditions. And this is the density contours that you see in there. So what you see here, if you look from top to bottom, are different methods. First are SPH, then is grid-based methods. And what is interesting to observe is like as the, um, as the flow uh, develops, you see that SPH and particle methods are much more stable. And the grid-based methods, they capture instabilities, as actually in this case they should do. And then the thing uh, fails. And here's a comparison, actually, when you do remessed particle methods, which is on the top, versus SPH versus adaptive mesh refinement. Over time, you see that it's kind of like a method that is in between. And, and you can actually see it here, um, that like SPH, PMH, these remessed particles, for compressible flows now, eh? not for vortex uh, type of things, um, you get an instability, but you don't dump the instabilities as much as SPH does, uh, you can be much faster than this because you do things on the grid, but you still are not as good as AMR. So what we did, because we were interested actually in these problems, and we were actually looking to find out what is the fastest and biggest and best code we can ever use, we moved to uh, finite volume methods, and we did problems with shock bubble interaction or multiple bubble-bubble interactions by going back and looking at simple grid-based methods and looking into Wino and HLLC and RK3 and all these kind of things. And we try to simulate uh, flows on Cartesian grids, and now the talk switches to the HPC aspect, and we wanted to see what is the fastest that we can get on a Cartesian grid. So we did things with using finite volume uh, techniques, but then the extra thing here was to do um, simulations that take advantage, advantage, that look into computer science. And look here, that what we have, we're looking, we're developing code by using techniques like roof line, performance analysis, parallel patterns, and, and we're going in and doing all sorts of assembly code. 
So what do I mean by this? And now you will see what's another comparison between grids and particles. One way to look at um, a code is to look at something called the roofline model. And the roofline model looks at the famous uh, flops, and it says flops is not only flops, but you can see it as gigabytes a second and flops per byte. So every code does flops because it goes onto the CPU and computes, but it also accesses things from memory. And flops per byte is how many flops do you do with the memory that you are bringing um, onto, uh, from, from with, the, with the stuff that you bring from the memory. So when you do something like that, you will see something I call operational intensity. You have three accesses to the memory, and you do one multiplication and one addition. This is your operational intensity. If you take any hardware, you can actually do something very interesting for it and find out if your code is suitable for that hardware. So what you can do is you can see what are the gigaflops of the machine, and you can do benchmarks for that. But the other thing that you can look is what is the gigabytes of the machine. And then this is the other curve that you get from your machine. And then what remains is this is the place where you can operate your code. So in this particular case, here I am. And no matter how fast my machine is, I'm not going to get these gigaflops even for this simple thing because I'm memory bound because of my operational intensity. So when we look at codes, you will find out that particle methods, in particular when they're doing things in N square, they're very nice because they can have very high operational intensity. And the grid-based methods, they're relatively bad because they have low arithmetic intensity. So what we did is we played with a lot of computer science to play with the grids, and, and we were actually able to push this thing over here. And we did simulations in one of the biggest supercomputers in the world. That was the Sequoia, 1.6 million cores. We were able to move from being memory bound to being uh, CPU bound. And then uh, this is, I think, probably the only fluid mechanics code that just flashed in front of your eyes. That's how fast it is. Uh, that, uh, that can do petaflops. So this is a code that does finite volumes reaching 14.4 petaflops. Um, it reaches about 72% uh, of the peak performance. Scalability is not an issue. It scales perfectly because it's very easy of the Cartesian grids. So we have been doing simulations on finite volume using about 13 um, trillion computational elements and, and simulating thousands of bubbles. And, and I will show you some of the results to do that. And, and this is the problem of cloud cavitation collapse. Each one of these bubbles is simulated with several um, thousands of grid points. And then for those of you who have done cavitation, you can see how the story of Rayleigh Placid is failing. There is no axisymmetric collapse. The yellow thing that you see here is the pressure. And you have a very irregular distribution of bubbles as you go from the outside to the inside of the cloud. So this is simple grids, no adaptivity. So the next thing that we wanted to do was to do adaptivity. So particle methods are adaptive because you can follow the particles where they go, but they're not very clever because all the particles have the same size. So the next thing we decided to do was to correct this. And because you don't want to have the same number of particles in something that is very smooth, instead you want to focus your particles when something is happening. So how do you find out when something is happening? You find out when something is happening by doing a wavelet analysis of the field that you're trying to discretize. So, and then what you can do is you can do a wavelet compression and throw away some of these coefficients, and then you can have a good representation of your image. Go back to particles and grids or whatever have you. Here is a grid. And then what I do is I have a certain quantity on the grid, and then I do a wavelet analysis, and therefore that's why you see the coarse level, which is blue, the green, and then the orange level. Then you throw away the coefficients, and that gives you a very nice adaptive grid. That's a competitor to adaptive mesh refinement, and it's nicer because you can use fast wavelet transforms to do um, all the ghost reconstructions. So with this method, uh, we can actually, in particular, care about flows with bodies because we can refine the area around the body by using a level set to represent the body. And then we can do a variety of things. Here is a shock bubble interaction. The top two require Meshkov instability. The top two have been done uh, with grid-based methods. And the last two have been done with particle-based um, methods. This is the top are compressible flows for which we don't use particles. For incompressible flows, we use particles. So we can do self-propelled bodies with complex geometries. And one of the biggest and the best simulations we do at the moment is we're looking at collective swimming, multiple fish swimming together. And that's only possible to do if you're able to have grids that are using this wavelet-based adaptivity. 
So I'd like to close my talk by moving to something which is not approximations, but it's particle models. And, and in particle models, I remind you that we are doing this, except that now we're looking into a force field. So some things we can do with particle models, we can do large scale simulations using molecular dynamics. This is flow inside a, a carbon uh, nanotube, a membrane actually composed of carbon nanotubes. This is uh, molecular dynamics of water and carbon nanotubes. And you can actually follow the same idea and you can do dissipative uh, particle dynamics. And this is our effort to try to actually build a, a lab on a chip, but on the computer. This is a, a, a device that is actually used to separate blood from tumor cells. So um, let's, I want to show you what is possible uh, about particle models, but I want to tell you that in the case of the particles, it's not only about flops. Uh, when, you, when you get things from the memory on grids, you can do your finite difference operations or whatever you do in your derivatives. In the case of particles, you have to worry about finding out who are your neighbors, how far your neighbors are changing. Molecular dynamics is different than DPD because in molecular dynamics, even every few time steps, the neighborhood remains about the same. Dissipative particle dynamics, the neighborhood does not remain about the same. And one more thing that is special about HPC and particle models is that the HPC, the computers, are not only doing flops. In fact, if you do 100% um, of the flops of a machine, you're using about 30% of the instructions that the machine is using. So another metric of seeing how good your code is to look how many of the instructions you're using of the machine. So I want to show you what we have been able to achieve um, with this uh, uh, simulations of DPD. We looked at the problem of cancer metastasis. And what you have is you have blood vessels going into tumors. This is not an, anim it's an animation. And what you see is you see tumor elements going into the, into the blood. Now people want to detect these circulating tumor cells. And it's a very tough problem because you get one circulating tumor cell into a billion red blood cells. So the experimentalists, they have come up with some wonderful devices. This is the group of Mehmet Toner in Harvard that he uses a concept called deterministic lateral displacement. And the idea is you come up with a geometry that it's able to separate the bigger cells um, that are uh, like the white blood cell, actually. They are not a circulating tumor cell. are moving up by using a concept of deterministic lateral displacement. And the red blood cells are moving down. And what we have achieved, we actually have simulated 0.1 milliliters of blood. We have done a total in the biggest simulation we achieved, about 1.6 billion red blood cells. Each one of these red blood cells has about 1,000 to 2,000 dissipative particles that are associated with it. So this is a trillion level uh, simulation. And what we can do is we can simulate one-to-one -one, uh, a, a device. So we have this, we spike inside it uh, um, a cancer cell, and then by using the concept of deterministic lateral displacement, um, uh, you will see that what happens is that the bigger cells, they're able to drift, to change basically the streamline in which they find themselves. And what they do is they, they, they start in a certain place, I think it should come up next, and then they keep traveling, traveling, traveling. And, and some of you maybe have seen the movie The Fantastic Voyage, where they shrink doctors into a nano submarine and then send it in to operate on the brain. So we can do similar things and nice visualizations. So the circulating tumor cells start there. And if I play the movie forward, you indeed get the separation, which is a proof of concept as what um, the experimentalists have done. So we have trillions of particles we use. We read PETA instructions, as I mentioned. Uh, this is a code that is outperforming, actually, by now, by a factor of 100 lumps. So we're running again on big computers that exist only in the US. And that's actually a pity for European researchers. Perhaps this is a political statement that some, there's great people who do a lot of HPC, but unfortunately, Europe does not have the big machines that Americans have, and we are thankful to our American colleagues for giving us access to them to do things like that. But uh, I, I would like to close here by showing you that particle methods is a wonderful method. Uh, you can go to simulate um, all sorts of different things by following the framework. Um, and do things from molecular dynamics and transfer RNA through a carbon nanotube to do diffusion in biological organelles, tumor modeling, to do all sorts of agent-type-based models for uh, the generation of cells, 
to study fundamental turbulence and to uh, look into other things like the collective swimming and how fish uh, are swimming by basically adopting this common framework. You don't have to be really a polymath. I think we are doing something very simple in our lab, and that is basically taking advantage of the amazing simulation powers of, of particle methods, of their simplicity. So in summary, um, particles as approximations, uh, I believe that to get to do um, accurate uh, direct numerical simulation type quality um, simulations, um, you need the grids. I think this idea of wavelet adaptive grids are um, excellent. Uh, I think in HPC the grids win, at least so far and with the implementation uh, we have. On particles as models, uh, I would like to say that HPC is not only about what flops and scalability you get, but what kind of scales and instructions you are able to address, access. And finally, I'd like to close by telling you that a big and interesting area for us is the area of uncertainty quantifications. Particle models are wonderful, but these force fields that you introduce contains a lot of ad hoc parameters. And the relationship to experiments, at least from the point of view of simulations, need to be reconsidered because we can tune parameters and get whatever we want. So we have to be a little bit more careful about our validation with experiments and how we collaborate with experimentalists. And I personally find this Bayesian uncertainty quantification as an interesting way to go. Thank you very much. Thank you.